Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. This is Career Fair Webinar for Environment Free Americas, and this is number four. I just want to go over a few ground rules before we get started. Please mute your microphone so um, we don't have any extra uh, background noise going on. We will have a question and answer session right after all of our presenters are done. So please hold your questions off until the end, but you're totally free to put your questions in the chat box. Um, if you're able to turn on your camera so we can see all of your faces and get to know y'all a bit more, and then totally feel free to introduce yourself in the chat to get to know each other a bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and just get started. We'll do a quick overview of our programs and then we'll go into our presenters. So welcome again to our career fair webinars with Environment for the Americas. This is our fourth career fair webinar. And I'm just going to introduce the team real quick. Um, Shelda Diaz-Mendez, she is our Mosaics program manager, but she is not here today. Um, but I'm going to throw it over to Chanel. Hi, everybody. My name is Chanel. I help Shelda with the Mosaics and Science Diversity Internship Program. I'm also the program manager for the Fish and Feathers Program and the Golden Gate National Recreation Area Internship Program. And I'm Vivian. I am the Latino Heritage Internship Program Lead and also one of the coordinators for the Resource Assistance Program. I'm going to throw it over to Catherine. Hi, I'm Catherine Shorten. And I almost exclusively work with the resource assistance program, although I do help uh, Stephanie, who is in here with the uh, CARES program, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So I guess we go to Paulina. Hi, everyone. My name is Paulina. Um, I'm the internships programs assistant here. So. Um, I'm fairly new and I'm just, I do what I can and I help with what I can here at, 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 with everyone. Um, and I, yeah, yeah. no one else to send it over to. <laughs> so yes, uh, Chu Yu, she is our graphic designer here at Environment for the Americas. So she does all the lovely flyers, any other graphics you may see. And then Susan Bonfield is the executive director for Environment for the Americas. Environment for the Americas, our mission is to engage a diverse workforce by fostering cultural awareness among its partners and by engaging underrepresented youth in the fields of research, education, conservation, and preservation. Um, Environment for the Americas was, these programs were sparked from the success for World Migratory Bird Day, and we are a nonprofit organization based out of Boulder, Colorado. Though we are based in Boulder, Colorado, we kind of have staff all over across the country and then within Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, Mosaics in Science is an internship program that takes place in the summer. Um, it's 12 or 20 weeks, dependent on the position. Um, it pays 640 a week, and the target audience is racially and ethnically diverse, underrepresented undergraduate and graduate students in the STEM field. Um, we have 21 positions this year, uh, four of which are DHA, so direct higher authority, which requires um, enrollment in a four-year institution of higher education in the semester following the internship, so fall 2023. The Latino Heritage Internship Program is designed to provide internship opportunities for um, young adults, undergraduates, and graduates that identify as Latino. This year, we have 33 positions in all 12 regions of the National Park Service, and 10 of those positions are DHA, or Direct Hiring Authority. Like Chanel just said, for Direct Hiring Authority to be eligible, you need to be enrolled in a four-year institution um, that following fall 2023 semester. Uh, the Fish and Feathers Internship Program is also a summer program. It's 11 uh, to 12 weeks in the summer, uh, one of those weeks being a pre-internship workshop at Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, it focuses on implementing, expanding, uh, and, and engaging community activities uh, related to birding and fishing in our national parks. Um, the pre-internship workshop is tons of fun. These are some photos from the workshop, so we're able to connect in mid-May um, and meet each other before heading off to everyone's sites.
Okay, so we made it to the Resource Assistance Program. Um, we partner with the U.S. Forest Service for these positions, two cohorts a year, a summer and a winter. We just wrapped up the recruitment for the winter cohort. They'll be starting. You must have a bachelor's degree. Um, you receive an awesome direct hiring authority after 960 hours. A weekly stipend, they can range from 500 a week to 750 a week. We also support housing with a $1,000 um, insurance. You can opt in if you need it and no additional costs. And there is a $2,750 in travel and training funds to support some additional gear you may need, professional development that you may need. Next slide. And then there's also the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we have internships. It doesn't necessarily follow a schedule when we recruit for them, um, but it does say that they can usually start if they're going to start March and August. You would just have to, to look. They take place on the refuge, and sometimes the field work is about uh, avian banding and things like that. So right now, all of our positions for the Latino Heritage Internship Program, Mosaics and Science and Fish and Feathers, and some positions for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are live on our website right now. Our website is environmentamericas.org, and this is the landing page. When you go in, you'll see this internships right here, and you'll click on that, and it'll lead you to all of the positions. And these are some resources. I will copy and paste these and put them in the chat. But now we're gonna go straight into our presenters for today. And Amy Martinez is first up. Awesome, hello everyone. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. Oops, sorry, Amy, I'm getting your slides up. No, it's okay. I'm really happy to be here. Just want to preface that I'm really uh, excited that I see some very familiar faces. Feels like it's been a long time. Wait, oops, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Alrighty, so uh, I was brought on uh, to go ahead and talk a little bit about my experience uh, from being a Fish and Feathers intern all the way to very luckily becoming a GS7 park ranger. Um, so we can go ahead and go over to the next slide. Perfect. So I think it was in May, May of this, so of last summer. Wow, it feels like a really long, like a lot of time has passed. Uh, I was selected to go ahead and be the Fish and Feathers intern for Everglades National Park down in Homestead, Florida. So like they were saying before, that first week of your internship, they flew us all out to Colorado. And that was a super exciting experience for me because I had never been on a plane before. So thank you EFTA for funding my first plane ride ever. Um, it was a super exciting experience just to be so far away from home. It was the first time I had ever been to Colorado and seeing mountains, I had no clue that there could be snow in the summer. Um, and it was generally a really, really, informative workshop where we learned tons of birding and fishing and techniques. We also learned um, different owling uh, methods out in the Rocky Mountains National Park. Very, very cold times for a Miami girl. Um, we were also surrounded by tons of peers uh, with similar interests uh, that I had never been accustomed to. Uh, usually when you talk about a young person that wants to do environmental studies in a city like Miami, it's not very common to find someone with those same interests. So this was a great part of the internship to be able to be surrounded by peers that were interested in all the same studies that I was. It was really eye-opening and refreshing to be able to have dialogue about certain things. Uh, so we also attended a ton of informative workshops like diversity and inclusion working with the NPS, 
bird banding, as well as fishing regulations within MPS. Uh, so this is me hugging a tree. I had never seen this type of tree before. Uh, also the mountains having snow on them was, it blew my mind. I did not know that was even possible during the summer. Uh, they loaded us up with some really great gear. I want to let you guys know, if you ever do the gear pack again, those reusable utensils, I still use them to this day. And I know that Leah and Nicole also still uses them. So those are really, really great. And everyone always compliments me about them. Um, so these are just some pictures about my experience over there. And that snowing picture was the last day uh, when we were leaving, we were kissed with a snowstorm that <laughs> we were all a little scared about. So if you can go ahead and move over to that next slide. Perfect. So after that week, I flew back home to Everglades National Park. Luckily, I lived only 10 minutes away from the park, which is not common for many of the interns. Uh, so I didn't stay on park housing. I went ahead and stayed at my parents' house. The internship was one of the most informative, one of the most refreshing and eye-opening experiences that I have ever had the opportunity to be a part of. It really showed me that there is so much to go ahead and do right in my own backyard when it came to environmental studies. I led and developed interpretive education programs specifically targeting youth. So that was anywhere from kindergarten to second grade, third to fifth grade, as well as sixth all the way through high school. Everglades National Park in the summer is not a very fun place to be. There's lots of hurricanes and mosquitoes. So a lot of my time was comprised of going into the community, such as YMCA camps, as well as adult nursing homes and other outreach events to go ahead and bring the park to marginalized communities. Everglades National Park is an amazing park because we have such a crazy urban metropolitan area so close, about 25 minutes away, yet it is one of the least visited by locals. It really is only attracted by tourists. So our outreach programs, are incredibly, incredibly important to our community to make them see a different side of life. So throughout my internship, um, I not only developed and led interpretive programs uh, with fishing and birding techniques, but I was also able to do a ton of other things. Um, I got to go out with the firefighters. I was also a part of the invasive species Tegu team. Um, if you guys can see there, those were my captures, very proud of them. I didn't think that I would ever have the stomach to do something like that, but working out here in the National Park School, it really opens your eyes to new places. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Perfect. And all of that, um, all of those opportunities, I can't be more grateful to EFTA and Fish and Feathers for leading me to now become an education park ranger for Everglades National Park as well. So my day is pretty much kind of the same of the stuff that I used to do as an intern. It's developing and leading interpretive programs for youth. So what we do is that every student, fourth and fifth grade student in Miami-Dade public schools, they have to come to the Everglades at least once. So yes, I do work with Emily. <laughs> um, so we go ahead and bring in all of the students and we lead them through a really immersive experience where they can go ahead and really see what nature is. Um, most of these kids, they are used to car horns and loud noises. So them just being in silence in the park is a experience that they might not be able to go ahead and reach if it weren't for these field trips. And it's really amazing because when I was in fourth grade, this was the first time that I ever got to see nature was through this very same field trip that I am now leading. So it's a pretty full circle moment. And I didn't realize until I started working there that I was like, well, I went on this very same field trip. And this was the first time that I had ever seen nature and wilderness. So it's really awesome to now be that be handing over the torch to the youth that are coming in now. Um, as an education park ranger, we not only are leading those field trips, it looks really, really different. So we're leading camps, um, which are three-day camps. We're also leading sluice logs, which is a wet walk hike through the Everglades. Uh, we're also doing Florida Bay programs. So that's snorkeling and diving programs with students, as well as doing a lot of virtual programs. So we're trying to bring programs to not only the students of Miami, but also to anyone around the world who is interested in it. So we can go ahead and go to the next one. So besides those duties, there are a ton of things that the National Park Service is very, very good about. They want their people to go ahead 
and be experienced in multi facets. So not only am I leading those programs, they also send us out for training. So I got an airboat training, uh, a fire, a wildland firefighter training, and all of these things are funded. Uh, through NPS, as long as you ask your supervisor and it's okay with the schedule. I also go to the zoo a lot. We have a partnership together. So that's me touching a, a hundred year old Galapagos turtle and feeding a giraffe. So every weekend we go out to the zoo and do some outreach, as well as different preservation and archives techniques that you guys can see those butterfly racks. They allow you to have the opportunity, if you're interested, to go ahead and get certified in all these things so you can build a greater resume. And those are just two of the pictures that I also took of some wasp and a mushroom, because not only are you working with nature, but there is also an opportunity to work with digital media. So we can go out, take pictures and upload them to our websites as well as post them in order to show our funders what it is that we're doing uh, since my position is grant funded. We can go ahead and go over to the last one. And then these are just some overall lessons that I learned throughout my time as an intern with Fish and Feathers and now as a park ranger with Everybase National Park. And the first one definitely has to be to not steer away from honored opportunities because you may feel that you are not experienced enough to go ahead and be in that space. When I first started as an intern, and I'm sure it's a pretty similar story, you feel like, you're small and everyone around you is bigger and they know more than you. But the reason that they're hiring you is because they want to hear your fresh and new ideas and they want to help you learn. That was the thing that I didn't understand. I was just so scared to do, for, do different things. But the more questions that you ask, which is another thing, don't be afraid to ask questions, the more they are willing to help you. They want young people from different backgrounds to come into the space and to really change it as well as to add to it. Um, another thing I learned was to talk to everyone. And I know that might be scary for some of the introverts and it's not saying to be fake or disingenuous with your conversations, but the more that you're able to talk with the people that are around you, I found that this often leads to the most great and unique experiences because somehow you'll be talking to someone and one thing will lead to another. And I'll be like, oh, you used to work at Rockies? Oh, that's crazy. Would you want to come at some point and lead a program? or it just happens to work out in these small ways when you're talking to someone. And that was a way that I have been able to go ahead and become certified in wildland firefighting was just, I was talking to a firefighter one day and he was like, do you wanna get a training? I was like, heck yeah, I wanna get a training, of course. So it's all of these ways, do not be afraid to talk to people um, because they are more than willing to help. And then the last thing that I'd like to go ahead and say is to keep an open mind. And although this, advice seems really, really basic. <laughs> it's one of the most important, I think, coming in as an intern. Uh, a lot of the times it may seem that you might not be doing exactly what it is that you want to, but you have to realize that that all leads into one greater thing of resume building, of experience, as well as there's these opportunities that come that you may not be up for, but as soon as you do it, you find that you have a ton of other avenues that you can take uh, just from keeping that open mind. And that right there is a picture of Mahala. She is the only Florida Panther in the Zoo Miami. And um, she's my friend when we do Zoo Miami days. Uh, so other than that, uh, that is everything that I have for today. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. And I'm really excited to read all of your blogs on the Environment for the America website to see what you guys experience. Awesome, thank you so much, Amy. Perfect. Okay, so we are going to go. Juan Pablo is next. Let me pull up your slides. Things, sorry, things got. Okay. Okay, Juan Pablo, whenever you're ready. Hello, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, depending on which time zone you are. 
I'm so excited to be presenting today, specifically because just about a year ago, I was in the same shoes that you were in, attending a webinar to see if the uh, EFTA programs were right fit for me. And like Amy said, there's a lot of uncertainty when you're when you're starting out, like, should I do it? Should I not do it? And hopefully today with our presentations, we can convince you to take the next step. Um, but more specifically, I don't wanna sound like a um, car salesman and try to sell you the LHIP program, but instead, I'm just here to tell you about one of the best summers I've ever had and one of the best jobs that I've ever had um, here with the Latino Heritage Internship Program. But more specifically, um, I'm gonna tell you about how Chasing Monarch Butterflies helped me land a year long internship position. Now, I spent my summer from July uh, 2022 through October 2022 being the science communication and resource monitor monitoring intern at Dinosaur National Monument. And the reason why they bring in LHIP interns is because since the 1980s, monarch butterflies have been declining or the population has been declining. And one of the things that we do here is we carry out um, research projects um, to, better, to better study them and provide data for scientists. And if you see in the pictures, um, in the sunflowers, that's me and another intern um, when a butterfly decided to fly into the sunflowers and we had to go in there and I'll talk more about it in a couple of slides. So if you do the next slide. So as, as I mentioned, one of the um, citizen science research projects that we do to contribute to the general body of knowledge of monarch butterflies is that we partnered with the Utah Pollinator Pursuit. And this entitles, we go out to the field and we search for um, basically eggs, uh, chrysalises, and caterpillars. Well, the first thing that we do is we look for showy milkweed, which is the picture on the far left. And showy milkweed is important because monarch butterflies only lay their eggs on showy milkweed, and um, caterpillars only eat the uh, from eat the leaf of the showy milkweed. So what we do is we approach uh, this plant and we usually turn the leaf over and try to look for an egg, as you see in the picture in the middle. Um, and if we don't find any eggs, we try to look for hungry caterpillars that are chewing, that are end up chewing on the um, milkweed leaf. And if you become the dinosaur intern or the science communication resource monitoring intern, you don't do these uh, citizen science research projects by yourself. Um, here at Dinosaur, we have a col collaboration with the United States Forest Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management, the Utah Division of Natural Resources, and the United States Department of Agriculture, where um, it's an where we collaborate with biologists and interns from all these agencies. So you're never by yourself when you're um, looking for these caterpillars or eggs. Next slide. Now, besides looking for eggs and, and caterpillars and chrysalises, what we also do is, if you look at the picture on the left, you see a gnat kind of sitting on a on a branch of a tree. And what we do is we carry these um, nets and we chase monarch butterflies throughout the week. And basically I was getting paid to run around and try to capture these insects. And with the Southwest Monarch Study, um, I'll direct you to the pictures on the bottom right where you see two monarch butterflies that I'm holding. Uh, one, of it, one of them does not have a sticker and the other one does have a sticker. And what we do with this project is we place these stick stickers in order to track the, um, the migration pathways of these monarch butterflies. The picture is a little bit too small, but um, it usually contains the identification number given to the monarch butterfly and also the email. And I'll direct you back to the larger picture with everyone there, uh, everyone at the meadow. What we do is we capture the monarch butterfly with the net and then we put them in little hotels that we call them or the um, laundry baskets that are closer to the gentleman's knees. And at the end of the survey, we all get together and we tag these monarchs. And we also uh, check to see if they're male, female, what kind of condition they were in, um, what kind of activity they were uh, participating before we caught them. Next slide, please. At the same time, when we're um, tagging these monarchs with the sticker on the wing, we also check to see if they have a, a protozoan parasite called Ophryocystis electroschira. And what we do is, as you can see in the picture on the right, I have this clear kind of adhesive stape where we hold the monarch and the abdomen of the uh, monarch kind of makes it, uh, kind of pops out. And what you do is you roll this sticker across the abdomen and, you're, and if it does have this protozoan parasite, um, it'll stick to the sticker 
And we ultimately, ultimately send this data to the University of Georgia where they look under the microscopes to see if they have this parasite. Now, the parasite does not necessarily kill um, the monarch butterfly, but it can cause wing deformities, um, making it harder for, its, for it to reach its um, overwintering sites or where they go for the winter and the crucial feeding and breeding um, habitats. So that was more of a day-to-day -day outlook of what I do. So basically I drive out to these sites with a couple of other interns and biologists from across um, multiple agencies and we chase, tag, and um, look for eggs, chrysalises, and caterpillars. Next slide. But I also wanted to highlight other key activities that you can also do as the LHIP Internet Dinosaur. And this is develop and present interpretive programs like Ayme was talking about. And here on the top left, we hold a public monarch tagging event at Dinosaur where we invite the public to come tag monarchs with us. And we also explain to them why we do it. And also if they have questions about the life cycle, the migration journey, we um, are there to assist them or to answer any questions. The picture on the top right was a um, evening ranger uh, program that I um, also hosted where I talked more about the life cycle. And as you can see, it's a variety of audiences. And in the bottom left, we invited about 50 to 60 eighth graders where they came out um, instead of having like the traditional classroom, they came out to learn about the monuments resources and also about monarch butterflies. And more recently, you can also, I presented at the Uinta Basin Birds and Butterflies Regional uh, Meeting where I gave an overview and I summarized the data for the entire sum for the entire summer. Next slide. Now, one of the coolest things about being a dino intern is that you actually get to raft the Green River looking for monarch butterflies. We started at the gates of Lodora Dinosaur National Monument, and we ended at the uh, Split Mountain Split Mountain Boat boat ramp and this trip lasted four days so you're basically living on the river for the uh, eight hours and then you park these rafts that you can see on the bottom left picture and you park these rafts and you end up just camping at one of the camp campsites um, that is basically on the side of the river and um, we successfully tagged four monarchs and we also found caterpillars and eggs throughout uh, the journey and then I also had an opportunity to learn how to um, how to row with the raft, which was uh, very interesting. And then next slide. And at Dinosaur, we also collaborate with the Grand Canyon National Park Latino Heritage Internship Program intern. As you can see in the top picture, it's myself and the uh, ladies sitting next to me on or standing next to my left um, is Cassandra, who was the LHIP intern. And we basically did cross training activities where she came up to Dinosaur uh, for a week. And then I went down uh, south to Grand Canyon National Park. And some of the activities that we did there was we collected native milkweed seeds. We planted horsetail milkweed at the Pima Point Pollinator Garden. We watered and propagated plants. We also tagged monarchs and we created social media content for the LHIPS Instagram and Facebook accounts. And we also co-wrote an article for the Park Science Magazine. Um, I'll put it in the chat if you're interested in reading it. And we also um, did all, all these activities with the Ancestral Lands Conservation Corps, uh, Zuni Pueblo Crew. And then next slide. So where am I now? Um, I'm still in college. I have a class left to complete my geology degree. And one day when we were loading the truck for a survey site, my supervisor was like, hey, I have an internship opportunity available and I think you'd be a good fit. You should apply. And I did. So I ended up becoming the community volunteer ambassador at Dinosaur National Monument. So I'm still here at Dino. And um, this is a year long position from October, 20, from October to September, 2023 and I help in the development of community engagement events and volunteer activities. I wanted to talk about um, just briefly some of the major projects, projects that I'm working on is a graffiti removal project where I'm working with the archeologists to remove graffiti throughout Dinosaur. Um, also, I am looking forward to 
kind of assisting at the youth river camps in the summer where we're gonna bring in um, at risk or underserved students to learn about um, watershed science and also uh, learn about river recreation. And then also um, I will be helping the LHIP intern with the Monarch Butterfly Conservation uh, Project that they'll be doing in the summer. And of course, bring in volunteers along with us. And lastly, um, we're kind of still talking about a dark sky conservation project towards the end, towards the end of um, this month where we're gonna use volunteers to help us monitor uh, light pollution here at the monument. And lastly, if I'm not doing one of those four, or if I'm not working on one of those four projects, I assist at the Quarry Exhibit Hall which is the bottom left picture um, where you see Ranger Aaron. And we have this huge uh, famous wall of uh, fossils. And I also assist at the visitor center. I create social media posts and I shadow interpretive programs. Next slide. And lastly, I wanted to give you some tips and advice for the application process. One of them is read previous LHIP interns blogs. You get to know about the day-to-day -day activities, um, about the specific um, internship position you're looking for. Also listen to the Conservation Diaries National Park Service podcast series. Previous LHIP interns have gone on to that podcast series and spoke about their um, experience. And I've also learned a lot from that or from listening to them. And also last year when I was applying, I got stuck with one of the questions that the application was asking me to answer. So to kind of brainstorm, I read the LHIP annual report and I recommend you to do the same, even if it's just skimming through it. And then at the very end, have the host site's project description, project description and your resume open alongside your uh, application and that will just make things go by faster. And like Amy said, do not let a lack of experience deter you from applying. Like I said, I had never been to Utah. I had never been to Dinosaur National Monument. Um, I had never worked with monarch butterflies. I studied geology. So most of the time it was just looking at rocks. So this is a perfect opportunity for you to just try things out um, while you're still studying. And I added this QR code that would send you to the Grand Canyon National Park uh, Monarch and Milkweed website, just in case if you wanna learn more about monarch butterfly conservation. And I, ended, and I added my contact information um, if you would like to chat about the application process or the interview. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much Juan Pablo. Um, so of course I had all the slides up and technology happens and the window is not showing. So let me pull your slides up Ricardo and then we'll go right into Ricardo Escobar. Sounds good. I'll just start off really quick by saying that I think from hearing Juan Pablo's and Amy's presentation that you know there are more recent EFTA interns, I was back in 2017, that this is evidence that the interns just get better and better because um, I came very unprepared. You'll, you'll notice in my slides. And so I'm just really impressed with all the work that Juan Pablo and Amy put into their, uh, their presentations and I'm taking notes I'm like, oh, this, I can prove my slides for the future. So just, just really enjoyed that. So just wanted to give you all kudos. Um, but yeah, as soon as these slides come up, um, you'll see that uh, I was Mosaics and Science. I think this is the old logo. <laughs> I'm going to date myself here a little bit, but uh, I was a Mosaics and Science intern back in 2017. So, wow, almost six years ago. Time flies. <laughs> but um, surprise the... I wonder if there's animations on the slide. There we go. Perfect. So I was fortunate enough that I landed a DHA internship uh, through the Mosaics and Science program. I was based out of Florissant Fossil Beds National Monument, which is in, in central Colorado. Um, and this was a primarily a paleontology slash education internship. And just like Juan Pablo, my, my background, my degrees are, are in geology. So I was really... I, I wouldn't say reluctant to apply, but I was really doubtful that I was going to be selected because I didn't have the paleontology knowledge or, you know, the formal education training, um, but nonetheless was was selected, right? And so I think that's a good reminder for us all to, you know, never be deterred from applying to things simply because we don't have that specific experience. You know, other other things apply, right, from 
whatever your background is. Um, but yeah, so I was there in that summer. It was an 11 week program. Um, and it was actually the first year that they offered DHA and the requirements have changed. And so I'm glad that they touched on that. I think the requirement now is that you are a currently enrolled student. I had already graduated um, with uh, my master's prior to enrolling in the Mosaics and Science program. And thankfully during that time, um, I was still eligible. However, the time started clicking before I had even started the internship. Um, that internship uh, was about three months after I had graduated. So by the time, sorry, a year and three months after I graduated. So by the time I actually earned my DHA, I had six months to use my certificate. I think the rest of y'all, if you're in a DHA position, you'll have two years from the moment you graduate. Um, and so that made, that made me aware of one thing when I started my internship and it touches on some of the things that Amy shared is network, um, talk to people. Um, and I, and I know that can be a, a difficult thing, especially if you are of a certain personality type, right? Where maybe you're a little bit more shy or more introverted, but the networking is huge. It's absolutely critical. Um, and I think it's because of my you know, dedication to, to meeting as many people while I was interning, not just at my site, but even in my area. Like I even drove out to Boulder and met with EFTA staff. It was three hours away, but I went up there because I wanted to network. I went to the regional office in Lakewood and Denver and chatted with people in the uh, geologic resources program while an intern. I even attended a training that was specifically for park service employees, but I asked my supervisor, hey, like, I want to be a park service employee. Can I do this training as an intern? And I had that support. So by doing that, I was meeting people all across the agency. And at that training, I met people from all over the country. And my supervisor had a good network and was able to put me in touch with people who were hiring. Um, and so I was able to secure uh, within six months a position. Um, but of course, the government works very slow. So another piece of advice is be patient. <laughs> very, very patient, even if it's seasonal jobs. Um, I'll tell you that it took, it took about four to five months for me to actually get hired after the initial contact. So in between that time, what did I do? I did other internships. Um, and I put that photo here on the right. Um, that I was a geoscientist in the park intern. And it was still at Florissant, so they were able to, to extend me there through a different program. Um, I put that other icon there that says scientists in the park because I think these programs have since been rebranded or, or bunched up together in scientists in the park. Um, so that, that was nice in that they were able to keep me um, employed uh, while I was waiting to get uh, the, the permanent hire through the National Park Service. Um, but in both of these positions, I was doing the similar similar thing. I was working with the paleontology crew and, and learning the resources and, and helping out with, with certain activities that pertain to their department. But more than anything, I was developing um, education programming for a geology paleontology camp that was, I think it was implemented for the following two or three years. And then of course, COVID hit, so it put a stop to that. But it was nice to be able to put these curriculums together. And in that right photo there, I'm actually testing some of that curriculum with the school group. Um, and, and it was pretty effective. And the following two years, it was an LHIP intern. Um, one of them was named Kevin. I can't remember the name of the other person, but anyways, they implemented that curriculum for the geology paleontology camp in 2018 and 2019 through the LHIP program. So it's, it's nice to see that. Um, the work that you put into these internships is is really there to have a long lasting impact. And, you know, Juan Pablo is, is evidence of that too, right? And it sounds like Amy too, you know, doing the same work, but now as a, as a permanent ranger. So, you know, sometimes we think, oh, it's only for a short while. Like how important can our job be? Well, it could be, you know, impactful for several years, right? So, so recognize that you are going to have a meaningful role in your position at whatever site you are uh, offered a position in. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. 
Alrighty. So um, it took a while, as I mentioned, about four to five months of finally getting hired. And thankfully, uh, starting in the spring of 2018. So this is almost a year after I started my Mosaics internship. Um, I was able to land a position as the education specialist at Petrified Forest National Park. Um, and that is in northeastern Arizona. I will tell you what, it was not my first choice in terms of location but because I had a narrow time constraint of six months, I had to snatch up whatever came first. But to be honest, the reason why I took that is because the person who hired me is to this day still a mentor of mine and a good friend. And I knew that I was gonna have his support and that was the most important thing. And I was able to start building that relationship while, while I was an intern, right? So that's why I just kind of want to reemphasize the fact that some of these relationships you build while you're in this internship are gonna, gonna last you your whole career, you know, maybe even lifetime. And uh, just, uh, yeah, I just wanna emphasize how, how important it is to, to keep that in mind while you're an intern, even if it's, you know, for a short time. Uh, but anyways, I was at <clears throat> Petrified Forest for uh, about two and a half years. Um, there, I primarily did environmental education programming during the academic years. Uh, working with K through 12 students, and I even led geology hikes for for uh, college groups, which was for me probably one of the most rewarding things because you know I was working with professors and folks like Juan Pablo, right, who were majoring in geology and visiting these sites so they could see all the amazing rocks and fossils as well. Um, but I think one of the most I think rewarding things when we talk about serving you know or working with marginalized communities was i was able to revamp our cultural demonstration program and that was that involved me working with our local indigenous groups um, and some of these were mentioned already like we worked with zuni hopi and navajo and even white mountain apache folks in the area and were able to get them to come and demonstrate their art on the site while being able to sell their work and interpret right, or share their own interpretations of the lands, right, because we know that they're the original caretakers of those lands, right, and they, they share that with the public, and just building those uh, meaningful relationships with, with folks from the tribes was, was just probably the most rewarding experience I had during my time at, at Petrified Forest, um, <clears throat> but while I was at Petrified Forest, I was still building my network, and I continue to do that to this day, so while I was there, I had applied to a detail at Rocky Mountain National Park. I was offered the detail, but I couldn't take it. Uh, didn't have my supervisor's support uh, just because we were short staff. Well, I decided to take a trip out to Colorado on my own so that I could meet this person and convince them that, hey, when that permanent position flies, hire me. I want this position. So I drove out all the way to Colorado. I think it was like nine hour drive one way. And I got to meet this person. Um, she's since retired. And sure enough, when that open position came up, she hired me. And so I became the lead interpretive ranger at Rocky. And I was there for a short while, just two years. So from uh, summer of 2020 to this last summer in 2022. And there, my, my role changed a lot. And you know, going back to what uh, Juan Pablo and Amy shared is, it may not be a linear path, right? You might major in you know, ornithology, study of birds. And in order to get there, to be working with birds, you might have to do other things. You might be a botanist for a bit. You might be an interpreter for a little bit. Um, and I think a good example of that is uh, a friend of mine who is now a geologist, but he started doing uh, more chemistry things, more lab-based stuff. And um, But, um, sorry, I got a little sidetracked there. Um, at Rocky, I, even though I, my title there says lead interpretive program or ranger. I work primarily with volunteers. So I completely moved away from doing environmental education and working with school groups. And now instead I was working with primarily retired folks, right? So mostly seniors. Um, and that was a whole different challenge. Um, now I'm working with people who are former CEOs or presidents, right? So a whole different power dynamic, but nonetheless super rewarding. Um, and a lot of these volunteers work to protect the resources and educating the public. Um, some of the groups that I managed were 
we, we gave them interesting names for these volunteer groups. And some of them were 70 to 80 volunteers strong. My biggest one was called the Elk Bugle Corps. It was about 80 volunteers in that one. And they would go out into the field during the fall rut when the elk are in heat, right? And they're trying to attract as many, well, the bulls specifically are trying to attract as many cows as possible. Um, we get massive traffic jams and people walking out into the meadows, putting themselves and the animals in danger. And so the volunteers go out and manage the traffic. They educate the visitors about, hey, we need to give them their space. This is their bedroom, so to speak, right? We need to stay out of it. Um, so it was just, I still had that connection with the public, right? But I was training the volunteers on how to interact with the public, which was um, incredibly rewarding. And I'm really happy to say that this last year in 2022, one of my groups, the Bighorn Brigade, as you can tell by the name, they uh, uh, helped to protect the bighorn sheep. They were recognized as uh, the Volunteer Group of the Year Award on, on a national level, which was pretty amazing. And now currently I switched. I'm no longer with the Park Service. I'm now with the Bureau of Land Management, which is still part of the Department of the Interior. And here my role is uh, being a park manager. So I manage our recreation sites. Um, and recreation is, uh, it's a wide encompassing department. So we, we definitely do interpretation and education and we work with volunteers, but there's also custodial involved. There's um, maintenance involved. And you can see me here, I'm removing fallen trees on a trail, right? Like that, I would never do that or have the opportunity to do that as an interpretive ranger. So I feel like in this position, I'm becoming a lot more well-rounded. Um, so I say that because I, I think it's a good way to experience a different culture and, and, and work style with a different agency. And so don't also be afraid to try different positions, but also different agencies, right? They all have their own unique and important mission. And I think overall by you know, trying different positions, different agencies, you're ultimately going to become a more well-rounded individual. And so that's all I had. And I think we're on to probably the, the Q and A. We have one more speaker, um, Detroit. Oh, that's right. Sorry about that. Oops. <laughs> You're fine. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Detroit. I'm pulling up your slides. Go ahead, Detroit. You're ready. Awesome. Hello, everybody. I'm going uh, to keep this short and sweet. Um, my name is Detroit James. i um, from Florida. Um, I did my internship in the Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest in uh, Southern Oregon as a law enforcement officer intern um, this, yeah, this past summer. Um, next slide, please. Um, just some some photos from from the internship. Um, working with um, different um, agencies such just as um, the county sheriff there in Joseph e. County, um, just greeting people, um, just making ourselves present and stuff, um, putting out fires, whatnot. Uh, you go to the next slide. Uh -oh. Slide kind of everywhere right now, but um yeah, working in the forest um every day is how can I say it? It's unplanned. Every day is, is a different day, a different like topic. Um, like just like city and um, county cops and city cop, me yeah, city sheriff cops, uh, state patrol cops. Um, every day brings something different. Um, but in the forest, um, we work a lot of environmental crimes. Um such as um, such as illegal mining, timber theft, um, search and rescues. We had a few search and rescues out there. Um, wildfires, also investigations, we, we um, take a lot of part of. And, um, and of course, like, just like anywhere, um, the forest 
come out to the forest, I never thought like there'd be like a lot of danger. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm gonna be out here just, you know, strolling around, just making sure campers and everybody's are doing their things. But here and there, there are criminals that come out into the forest and um, we do make make arrests, uh, warrant arrests, so forth. So we try to keep everybody, all workers, all campers, all visitors in the forest safe. Um, but other than that, um, we do a lot of patrolling by truck, boat, ATVs, and other um, transportation. Even um, this past December, we went skiing, um, patrolling on skis, which was awesome. Um, so there's a bunch of cool stuff like that. So next slide, please. And um, throughout my internship, I did a lot of training, um, got CPR, first aid certified. Um, Trained with um, canines, we have a, a canine um, unit here in the Forest Service, so that was fun. Yeah, me in a, in a bite suit. First time in a bite suit, actually. That was pretty fun. Those dogs have have bites to them, like gnarly bites, man. They And they can, yeah, bring you down. You can see in the picture the dog. He, he pretty much did drag me down to the ground, but then, like, really captured that moment. Then in um, the last... Uh, left corner, bottom corner picture was me doing a FPO training, Forest Protective Officer training, which is allowed to anybody in the in the Forest Service. Um, pretty much teaches you how to um, deal with certain situations, how to how to write ticket citations, along those lines. Uh, you go to the next slide. Uh, where I am now, um, I will be staying in the Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest. Uh, thankfully, to this internship program. Um, just like the previous um, presenters, um, just networking and just being on top of your job, just showing up every day with open mind, and just just and just just being present and just just showing that you want to be there will will help you like open doors. And thankfully, they're like um, everybody loved me and they decided to keep me there. Actually, so I'm currently here at um at Flexi on um, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, um, learning how to become a, a federal um law enforcement officer, and um eventually after my time here, I'll be heading back out to Oregon to do field training. Then they'll let me loose, and I'll be doing um my patrols and stuff out there in the in the Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest, and I'm officially uh, employed as a full time law enforcement officer now. Next slide. Um, tips and advice, um, apply for intern positions that you're passionate for or even interested in. Um, I never thought I'll be doing this actually. Um, previously, I was in the army and uh, working in human, human resource. Um, I thought I'll be stuck behind a desk all my life, but um, I had a change of heart and, um, oh, thank you. And um, then, then know that Forest Service even had like law enforcement, any any of the um like land of the terriers, like National Park Service has law enforcement, BLM has law enforcement, and they all have internship positions and whatnot. And like if you're interested in this, I, I suggest like you you look into it. It's it's pretty awesome. Um I was gonna say, just like the presenter earlier, the like the lack of experience deter you from applying. So I have no like law enforcement experience at all. And um coming into it, like you they'll give you like all the trainings, like you'll do all the ride alongs, like you'll hang out with all the other agencies also and just learn what everybody does. So that's pretty cool. You'll get the experience right there on hand. Um reading, yeah, previous um intern blogs, which is it's kind of poor. Like I, before I did this, I looked at some previous blogs to um, just reassure myself, ease my mind into what I was getting myself into. And um, of course, yeah, being being comfortable with being out of your comfort zone. So law enforcement, like I say, was something I never thought I would be doing, especially in the forest. So just being out there and dealing with certain situations and, and just meeting people and just, I don't know, I'm before this, I was a very um, quiet person. I kept to myself. I really never talked a lot, but this job um, internship like gave me the 
the courage to go out and um, just be very vocal, very, very comfortable around people. So I'm grateful for that. And um, yeah, my last point or tip, um, just have fun and just, and just enjoy this because it's, it goes by, but like, it's just so much fun when you, so much fun, like time goes by, we have so much fun. So that's all I have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Detroit. And thank you, Ricardo, Juan Pablo, and Amy for sharing your experiences with us. I am now going to open up the floor to any questions that anybody has. Um, you can feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask out loud or drop the questions in the chat and we can answer or ask those out loud for you. Yes, Josephine. Hi. Um, first of all, I just want to say Lovely presentations from everyone. Thank you. That was really informational. Um, for people who are park rangers, I was just curious what the most surprising or like unexpected part of your job is. If that's for me or? Uh, anyone can answer. that's a good question so so i'm i'm from florida i'm a beach boy so like this is my first time out of oregon and in the mountains and stuff um i say like the most unexpected thing is just um how much environmental crimes happen out in the forest like i never thought about people still in wood like timber like i guess like it, it get of course it get cold out in oregon and people need timber for for their fireplaces but yeah, people like cut down trees illegally and and take the wood with them and which was crazy. I thought I was odd. That and um gold um yeah, gold mining too. Like I didn't know people still like mine like for gold and gold pen and stuff. I thought it was like a thing of the past. So people still do that out here, which is crazy. But well, some people they do it illegally, which is crazy. They bring out their big commercial machines and drill into like rivers and like and all that stuff and like, you know, just destroy land and and mess with the, the ecosystem, which is which is messed up, but um just just something that was eye opening to me. Hi Ricardo. Um I have a question for you. So I was interested in hearing, did you say you were a park manager now? Were you, what yes. was your current position? Yes. I was, I was interested in like, if you would be able to provide an email or something to ask you more questions on that. Um, just because that's, I mean, it, I'm interested in exploring all the different, uh, you know, departments and stuff and hearing about your experiences there were particularly interesting to me. So thank you. Yeah. And um that's why I was like, oh, man, everyone had better slides because they put their contact. I didn't, uh, but I just put it in the chat right now. So feel free, anyone, if you have questions to reach Thank out. Thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. Madeline. Um, so I'm studying environmental science right now, and I was just wondering, like, how do you guys kind of narrow down where you wanted to go from a broader category into, like, what area of environmentalism you wanted to study? Are you speaking more of like studying undergraduate, graduate, or are you talking more about environmental towards which internship I chose? Um, I'm trying to think of like what career path I want to start going down. So I guess like figuring out like which internships you would be interested in. I'll, I'll touch on this really quickly. Um, I didn't branch out too much when I was applying for Mosaics because I was deterring myself from many opportunities. So I had only applied to two. One was strictly a geology related internship role, which I did not get. And the only reason I applied to the paleontology and education one is because I had taught as a graduate assistant and fossils are in rocks. So I'm like, I'm halfway there, but maybe others can talk more about 
yeah, specifics. When I was looking at internship opportunities, you can apply to three, or at least it was um, three last year. I'm not sure if it's the same. Someone could probably correct me. Um, and the way I saw it was Dinosaur National Monument Summer to Ricardo. It was like, okay, they have dinosaurs in geology. And I was like, this is a place to go. But then I wasn't quickly introduced to the world of monarchs. So I think from my experience and my advice would be don't get so tunnel vision on one certain environmental field you just I, my recommendation would be just to try um a certain internship that is somewhat similar to what your um future goals are thanks i think the one more thing i i want to add is um uh, I have a friend, Lima Soto. She used to manage mosaics and science. She, I think, got her PhD in geology. Um, it took her many, many years to become an actual geologist. She knew she wanted to be a geologist. In between that, she managed internship programs, right, with like mosaics. And now she's a GS-13 geologist with the Forest Service. So it wasn't a linear path. So, and that's okay. And, and, and know that maybe you have your mindset on, I want this a career. And Maybe it's going to be five years, 10 years, 15 years down the line and getting there might, you know, may be more of like a zigzag type of pathway, but know that that's okay. I will um, say, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I will say that if you're just in general interested in these two topics, which is conservation or science communication, then EFTA is the place to go, um, regardless of what um, specific details you're into. Um, I was just kind of asked kind of like a related question about maybe any advice you'd have um, for someone. I feel kind of like what I studied in undergrad, like I didn't really study a lot of natural sciences, but I'm really, I kind of feel like, do you think that there are many interns that are able to like work in natural resources and like work for the parks and stuff that didn't like have the right degree and if you'd have any advice for that um because I kind of feel like I'm really interested but I feel kind of like intimidated and I don't want to like not be helpful or useful I don't know if that makes sense <laughs> I'll give you an experience similar to what you just mentioned when I was being interviewed for the um the LHIP position my supervisor had asked me, so why do you want to um, help with butterflies? Why do you want to study butterflies? And at that moment, I was like, well, the last five years I've been studying rocks and like mountains and oceans, and I didn't know how to answer. But I made a connection because I um, remember that I used to work at the Lowe's Garden Center, and that's the first time I saw a monarch butterfly, and that's the first time I was introduced. So I don't um, be like I said, don't be deterred if you don't have any experience. If you just have one certain connection with the project description, um, you should run with that. Thanks. I really appreciate your your answer. There is a question in the chat, and I'm going to read it out. Um, did you guys ever do bilingual nature talks, and was it difficult to translate fauna and flora terminology into Spanish? Yes, 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 yes. Um, we partnered up multiple times at Rocky to do programs for Latino Conservation Week where we brought in Spanish speakers. I always had my notes because scientific words for me is challenging to translate. It's not as intuitive as just, you know, casual talk. So um, I'll admit a lot of it was kind of Spanglish and thankfully the audience understood. Um, but it's, it's challenging, and especially if you're the only one, right? If you don't have someone else that is fluent or even more fluent to bounce ideas off of, it can be more challenging. Thank you, Ricardo. Any more questions? I had a bit of a general question. Um, for people who have their master's or for current graduate students, is there generally a tendency for people that fall into that category to pursue the DHA positions or are we welcome to kind of apply for 
any of the LHIP positions? And also, is there a different like rigor or expectation between the two? I'm sorry, I, I joined in late. And so I'm not sure if you already answered that. Um, I can answer this one. Um, DHA positions are open to undergraduate and graduate students. The requirement is that you have to be enrolled um, in a four-year inst institution of higher education. Sorry, this is a mouthful. In the semester following your internship, so fall 2023. So that applies to undergraduate and graduate students. And this is for Mosaics and LHIP. Specifically, um, DHA positions are more rigorous. So we have specific project requirements. Um, they're typically more independent and just require more effort. Um, so that's hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I was also like to ask a second question. Let's say like I have I'm really interested in one that's not a DHA position. Would I be able to pitch kind of more independent projects or things that maybe I could do more independently as a master's student? Totally. Yes, we've definitely had that before. Um, and kind of a component of our internship is, is that uh, mentors need to develop a work plan with the intern. So that's something built out based on like what a candidate brings to the table. So if that's something you're interested in, they can definitely support you in that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I had a question for Detroit. Um, so in your presentation, you mentioned that you never saw yourself in law enforcement. Um, so before that, what did you see yourself doing? Hey, Kay. Um, I pretty much see myself um, pretty much working human resource or something along those lines, um, staying, staying behind a desk kind of deal, but I Kind of wanted to like go off the beaten path. I don't know. Just wanted to do something outdoorsy. I don't know. I I looked into this internship program and I was like looking for for jobs like along my line. And I saw uh, law enforcement um internship positions open up and and I was like, hey, why not? Let me let me check this out. And and I applied and thankfully I I got the the position and. They sent me out to Oregon shortly after and just fell in love with with what the what law enforcement officers do. I wanted to add something to what Detroit said, because um, I think this could be important for folks. Um, if you have an open mind, I know a lot of people in the Park Service who struggle to get positions in the fields they want, whether that's education or interpretation, archaeology, you name it. And one of the easier ways from what I've gathered these years is to begin as a law enforcement ranger because there's always a need. Many of my supervisors or coworkers started off as law enforcement rangers with the Park Service and then branched out to different departments like interpretation or biological sciences. Awesome. Well, if there are no more questions, we can go ahead and close this out tonight. Thank you so much for all of our presenters for presenting and everyone for attending. We will have two more career fair webinars next Thursday and the Thursday following after. The topics will be living in um, a national park or living on the site and also interviewing for the application. We will post this recording on our websites following today's webinar. You can go ahead and stop the recording.